you just got the Sony ZV-E1 and it's one of the best cameras that Sony could ever offer. However, the best settings have yet to be programmed. I'll be going through the menu to show you the settings that I use to give me a smoother experience and all of this without compromising on quality. All right, so first things first, I'm just going to go ahead and leave our mode setting on video and this just gives us access to all the modes that we want. All right, now that we're in the menu, you can go ahead and just skip over this first menu and we'll go to that last. So on the left hand side, we have my menu, main. Let's just start off with our shooting menu. Over here on file format, if you're conservative on your memory card space, HS will do fine as far as 4K is concerned. But if you want higher quality, then you can go ahead and move up as much as your SD card tolerates. But for me, I prefer HS and that's great. We're still getting 4K for a decent amount of size. No problem. Moving over to movie settings. I prefer to shoot at 24 frames per second, so I'm gonna keep it as that. For the recording setting, you can go ahead and get the most data out of it. 100 megabits per second, 422, 10 bit. But again, for me, 10 bit at 30 megabytes for these kinds of videos is more than enough. Especially for the typical vlogger, this is perfect. Again, you're still getting 4K with great memory card space management. But if you want the best of the best, consider the 100 megabits. Okay, going back. The SNQ settings. You can program SNQ settings in different ways, especially when it comes to time lapses, whether it's like a hyperlapse or even in slow motion. And I'll link to that kind of video that I have down below. But for me, I personally like to program mine for slow motion. Now keep in mind that when we use SNQ mode, there won't be any sound recorded. So if you're just recording B-roll and you're not wanting to put any sound, just keep that in mind. So for frame rate, let's go in there. I want it to set to 24 frames per second and I want to do it at 60 frames per second for the SNQ frame rate. Ultimately, this will be two and a half times slow motion. Good for me. And then going down below, SNQ record setting, we can actually again make this 30 megabits per second, 420, 10-bit. Going back, time-lapse settings, we can go over here, we can set our frame rate, 60 frames per second, that's fine. Frame rate settings, for me, 24 frames per second is fine. At an interval of one second, that's cool. Record setting, also again, 30 megabits per second, 420 10-bit. And for the video light, it could be on for a few seconds just to know that I'm recording. Back. Log shooting setting. When we look in here, I have it set to off. And the reason that I had it set to off is because I just use a personal LUT that I use for these videos and it's perfect for the rest of whatever I shoot. But if I want to go ahead and use S-Log3 and grade everything in post, then I would turn this on. And when we do turn it on, it gives us this and I would just leave it as is. But for now, we'll leave it off. Going back to proxy settings, I don't really touch this, I just leave it off, but you could also record a proxy file just in case your computer may not handle your 4K footage. So you can go in here and go ahead and make it XAVC SHD if you want the higher quality or HS if you want the less quality. Again, I don't use these settings, so we're just going to leave everything as is. Going back down, APS-C shooting mode. For APS-C Super 35 mode, it's already off by default if you use 4K. But if you use 1080p, then you can turn this on or it's on by default. Lens compensation, I just leave everything as is. Auto, auto, off. Going back, now let's move down to media. You don't really need to touch anything here. File, file settings. File number, I prefer mine for a series. This just makes things easier for my organizing workflow. Let's not reset it. I prefer date and then title. And then you can go in here and I prefer my initials and the camera that I'm using. So I have MBS, ZV, E1. Going back, shooting mode. Personally, I like to use manual exposure as I like to control every little thing and like to have my scenes planned as far as having it set, talk, and then move on to the next scene and then set the settings again. However, if you're walking and talking, you may want to consider using an automatic mode. So when we go in here, you may consider having aperture priority if you want to have certain things in focus or out of focus, or you might just leave it on program auto and just let it do its thing. That's totally fine when it comes to video because it's a vlogging camera. But for me, because I don't like the look of the camera changing in and out, manual exposure. But this camera is supposed to be better at keeping the exposure quite even without even noticing that change. If I get more results on that, then I'll share that with you in another video. But for now, manual exposure. Okay, for the next camera setting memory, I just leave this off. I have yet to save a profile here. For a memory recall or a camera setting memory, I just will leave this off for now. Going back, silent mode settings, I turn it off. Target functions, I just leave this as standard. Release without lens, enable. This is important if you're gonna shoot with manual lenses, like I have a Helios lens, and that you won't really release with lens on. Your choice, I'll just leave it as is, enabled. 
I keep this on just in case I shoot with manual lenses. Auto flickering, leave this as is. Audio recording, of course, is gonna be on and by default, I leave it on 12. And this audio out timing, I just leave it as live. With noise reduction, leave it as is. I'm still testing that part out. Microphone directivity, you can choose front, all directions, rear. I just leave it as auto. Most of the time, I'm using an external microphone, the DAD D4 Duo, which has a front and back microphone. But um, if you want a minimal carry, you wanna leave this on auto. Microphone direction, select setting. Again, it's all here. Going down, I leave all this. For time count, I leave all of that alone. Image stabilization time. For steady shot, I like to leave as active if I want things to be in like a tripod locked off shot. Or if I really want the smoothest footage, like gimbal lake footage, then I'll go with dynamic active. Otherwise, if I want a bigger frame, a larger frame, then I'll just keep it as standard. And then the steady shot set to auto adjust. Framing stabilizer, I leave this off. This is that AI feature that tracks you when you have your camera locked off on a tripod and then it just goes off and all right, it's following you here, following you there. I don't use that too often the way that I shoot. Moving on. Zoom range, I always have this set to clear image zoom, which is way better than digital zoom. Step zoom magnification, leave those settings on. Times four, I have yet to try it, but it's usually the worst option and I learned that from the ZV-1F. The zoom lever speed, I try to keep this as fast as possible, just in case if I'm, I really want to get in the action and it's like last minute, especially for a vlogging camera. If I want it to go slow, then I'll just kind of creep on the uh, the lever there. And then over here, custom key for zoom speed, same as well here. And then remote zoom speed, also here. For grid line display, I like to leave it on. I like to play on those rule of thirds. And as we hear, but of course you can have it as you like, diagonal as well, but I'll stick to rule of thirds. And to know whether or not I'm actually recording, emphasize recording display, we'll leave that on. For marker settings, I generally just leave this off because again, rule of thirds is enough for me. This might come in handy if you want to go ahead and crop in your image and give it those cinematic bars and be able to know where your framing is. Product showcase set, I like to leave this off. For defocus level setting, I just leave it as large. I don't even really use it. Cinematic vlog setting, I also do not use this. If I want to add bars in post, I'll do it in post, but most of the time I want the full range of the image. Self timer I think is a great feature, especially if you're going to operate by yourself and set the camera down, hit the button, count three seconds and walk over to do the thing that you're going to do like a Casey Neistat vlog. So we'll actually turn that on. And auto framing settings, we're just going to leave this as is. Again, I have yet to test this more. Now into the exposure and color settings. So for exposure, I usually leave this on. ISO, again, I have this set to 1000 because I'm shooting manual. Otherwise, you could set this to automatic if that's what your vibe is. I leave the ISO range limit alone. Doesn't really apply to me much because I most often use manual mode for ISO. Next is exposure compensation. Depending on the setting, I'll usually keep it one stop lower if it's in a super bright environment or if it's in a super dark environment, maybe I'll go plus one or plus two, but most often I leave it at zero. Again, this really applies for people who are shooting in automatic modes, even if you shoot manual with auto ISO. Exposure step, 0.3 is enough for me. And this we'll leave alone, going down. Metering mode, I leave it as multi. This means that it's pretty much measuring the light throughout the scene and not just one part of the photo. So right now I'm wearing like a lighter shirt. So then my exposure on the metering mode reads at plus one. But if I wore a dark shirt, it would come up as lower. But anyway, we leave it as multi. It just analyzes the whole scene and how the exposure is going. Face priority, yes, also on. Spot metering point, leave it at center. Going down for white balance, I also try to dial that in also manually as much as I can, like in this setting right here. But depending if we're out in the park or something like that and the change of scenery is going on too frequently, then I'll leave it on auto white balance. Priority set and wipe, auto white balance is set to standard. For shockless white balance, I just want it to be fast, so we'll leave it at one. Going down here, dynamic range optimizer, it's already off. And that's because I'm using a picture profile, which is a LUT that I specifically made for this kind of set and for this kind of setting. For picture profile, you can choose one through 11, or at least whatever numbers you get through 11. But again, I have my own LUT here. Of course, you can include your own as well. The rest of the LUTs that I use down here, people always ask what kind of LUTs that I use. I use the one from Joel um, Fomolero. Oh, I forget his name, sorry for butchering your name. Um, but it's the Phantom LUTs, and I'll link that down below. When I use these LUTs, it's already baked into the footage when you're using it from the picture profile menu. So no post-processing for me. It just, it's easier for me to just go through these videos and the quality of the video will look great. For selecting the LUT, this is more applicable if you have S-Log 3 or log shooting mode on, but we don't. Manage user LUTs. And this is where you would follow my tutorial that I would have linked down below on how you would go ahead and import LUTs into your camera. And over here, you can see all the LUTs that are loaded in here. 
and you have up to 16 LUTs that you can put. Going back down, soft skin effect, leaving that off. Zebra display, I left that as default. Zebra level also on 70 as default. For focus mode, for video, continuous autofocus. Unless you want to specifically dial in your manual focus, then you, of course you would choose manual focus. For transition speed, I already found that the default settings were great, so I'm gonna leave it here at seven. For transition speed, subject shift sensitivity is five. And AF assist, this is more appropriate if you need manual focus. For focus area, I usually leave it as wide, but if you need specific parts, you could also use zone or spot. Focus limit, I just leave this as is. But of course, if you wanna play around with these, you can turn each and one of these on. For the focus area color, leave it as white. Leave that as is. For this last one, we'll just leave it at standard. Moving on down to subject recognition, leave it on on. Usually I'm gonna be shooting humans. Recognition target select, we leave this all on, all of these selected. Again, this is the benefit of using the AI in this camera. Right, left eye, also is left to auto. But of course, if someone has a preferable side that they have, of course you would go ahead and dial this in specifically. Subject recognition from display on. Face memory, I don't have any locked in here but you can add that on your own and register them here. For registered face priority, let's say you're at a wedding and you're gonna go ahead and want specifically the bride and the groom, this camera would go ahead and focus on those people first rather than anybody else in the frame when it detects those people. Moving on down to focus assistant, I generally don't use focus mapping. Some people like it, some people don't, so it's up to you, but for me, I usually leave it off. For me, I prefer focus peaking. All right, so down here, I usually prefer two seconds and times one. Right now, because I'll be using autofocus on this camera, I have peaking display off, but if I'm switching to manual or use a manual lens, this will be turned on, and this way I can better dial in my focus. Right now, I have my peaking set to mid and my color set to red. Going down, we can skip most of these down here. Yeah, we can skip most of these here. For playback settings, I didn't really change anything, so we're just gonna skip right into network settings. I didn't really do anything in this first menu for network, but down here in streaming, USB streaming, you can go ahead and change if you want to output 4K or HD. Typically for me, HD is okay at 30 frames per second, and I like to have the option to record during the stream should I want that backup file. Yes, it may consume more power, but since this only has one SD card and my computer is one form of recording, it's kind of like redundant just having backup just in case. Going back, Wi-Fi didn't change much. For Bluetooth pairing, if you have like a tripod, a Bluetooth tripod, that would work great and you would pair it in here. I don't, so we're just gonna leave that off. Wired LAN, we we'll leave that alone. USB tethering, also leave that alone. And if you wanna save some battery, some people say that they kinda get a little bit more battery out of turning AirPlay mode on. Just remember to turn it off if you plan to transfer any of these photos or videos onto your phone or whatever device wirelessly anyway. Now for the setup menu. Area and date. Now most of you who are going to ask me, oh, I don't see 24, I don't see 30p, I don't see 60p or 120p. And that's because of this right here, the NTSC and PAL selector. So if I switch to PAL, I'm only gonna get, I think 25, 50 and 100 frames per second or P. But since I'm using NTSC, now I can see 24, 30, 60 and 120. It all depends on your region, so. It's all up to you. I know they used to keep it this way because of how there was flickering problems and how the images would show in video in respective regions. But here in the US, we're using NTSC, so I'm going to be sticking to this system. Probably doesn't matter that much now on YouTube, if you're just sticking to YouTube. Reset and save settings. This is where we would go once we're all done with this video that we would go and save this onto our SD card and then offload it onto our computer. And I'll leave that alone for now. Going down to operation customization. For photos, I basically left things on except for here on the rear for button one here. I left that as AF on. Lately, I've been in the practice of back button autofocus rather than half pressing the shutter button. For number four, I have it set to drive mode. At least that's what it was on default. On the top, it's the same. Lens is the same and the dial is the same. Moving towards the video custom keys. Everything here is practically the same except for number six. I changed that to peaking display select that you can find on page 25 of 32. And so like I said, if I wanted to go ahead and shoot manually, use a manual lens, I would hit this button so that I could see the lines of where the focus is at. And this is exclusive for video. Going down, I just left everything as is. Same thing here on the lens and same thing here for the dial. For playback, we're just gonna leave that alone. Didn't need to change anything. For function menu settings, for photo, I left here as peak, metering mode, steady shot, follow function menu, focus, interval shooting. Left this here alone for the follow function menu, silent mode, subject recognition, AF, also your white balance. Down below, we have picture profile, audio recording level, steady shot, recognition target, 
focus mode, auto framing, crop level, which again, these two are in tandem, focus area, touch function and shooting, frame stabilizer, microphone directivity, so it's like auto, front, back, all around, and again, white balance. Going down, different settings for stills and videos. I like selecting all of these because I want both of those settings to be completely separate. Going down here for display, I left everything here alone, and I like to record with the shutter. Just ergonomically convenient for me. Down below, leave that alone. Again, the dials for the photo, the same. For video, the same. My dial settings, I decided not to touch it this time and just leave it as is because I can pretty much access most of my settings through the function menus and through my custom buttons. I'm gonna leave these alone and leave this unlocked. Touch operation on, shooting screen. This is how I left things. Playback screen, left that as on, menu screen on. Screen reader, we don't need that for accessibility. For monitor brightness, I have it set to manual as we're indoors, but of course on a sunny day, we can go ahead and use sunny weather. But of course it'll consume much more power, so we're just gonna leave it on manual. For display quality, for battery management sakes, we're just gonna leave it on standard. You can choose high, whatever you prefer. Standard is fine for me. For monitor flip, again, we'll leave that on auto. For display option, we left these all the same. Again, these grayed out options here are more for log shooting, so you won't be able to access those. Going down, auto monitor off, we just leave does not turn off. For power save start time, I leave it at two minutes. I often easily forget to turn this thing off, especially now that we have a different power button, at least in a different location. Power save by monitor, both are the same or both are linked. Auto power off temperature, I set this to high so that this thing, whenever it senses that it's going to overheat, that it would turn off at a certain temperature. It's usually set to standard, but I leave it at high because I just want it to be able to tolerate as much as it can and so I can capture the moment. But this is more relevant for people who are doing long continuous shooting. Going down volume settings, keep it at seven. This is for playback, channel one and two. For audio signals, this is one of the first settings that I change because I don't want any extra noise and I just turn that off. For USB, I leave it as select when connected. So you have all your different selection here, USB streaming, mass storage, MTP or PC remote. But we don't need to decide this now, but when we plug in the USB-C. Leave this on multi, USB power supply, leave it as on. I left these all the same. For HDMI info display, if you wanna go ahead and are recording on an external monitor or on the Axun C mode, then you would want to turn this on. This is if you wanna record your camera screen and then share it later for another video or something like that. Control for HDMI, I leave this on. Most of these settings I also left alone. Now we're gonna add items to my menu. So we're gonna go down here to shooting mode and memory recall set memory and set from my menu one. For the next option, I wanna use shoot mode so that I can access those saved settings for different scenarios. Menu one. Next up, I'm gonna go to the Bluetooth menu and go ahead and add my phone connection. Smartphone connection here on network. Camera one. And then we're gonna put this in my menu one. For battery saving purposes, we're gonna put airplane mode in here as well in my menu. Next, we're gonna do monitor brightness for those ever-changing light scenarios outside and indoors. My menu, there we go. Next up, because I shoot these kinds of videos and I want to be able to have that option to quickly access sharing my screen, my camera screen to a video recorder, I'm gonna go also and add the HDMI info display. But let's go back to the main menu that we skipped before. I'm going to be shooting my videos in 24p. As much as possible, I try to follow the 180 degree rule and shoot one over 50th when shooting 24p. For ISO, as you saw, I already set it to auto and everything else is pretty much the same that we set to our other menus. And this is kind of like the quick access menu that isn't mentioned in the function menu and isn't already in my, my menu. Now, if we're happy with all those settings, we can save it and then offload it onto our computer and leave it as a backup. Now your A7S, I mean, your Sony ZV-E1 is all set. But if you wanna get even more out of this camera, consider the accessories that you'll be getting as well. Fortunately, I left the video right over there. How convenient.